All right, welcome to Utah Studies. Listen, uh, filming the class every week is not working out, and one of the key reasons is I have to wear a mask and I have to use a microphone and the audio is bad. So we're gonna try something different. Also, there's a little bit of overlap between last week and this week. So if you've seen some of this, I'm sorry, there'll be a short review at the beginning and then we'll get into some new stuff. I think I'll have a better go at it next week. I appreciate your patience during this process. It's been a learning curve for me as well. Let's get into it. All right, cool. You need to know the difference between um, a national park and a national forest. You need to know climate, the three things that affect the climate, latitude, elevation, distance from the ocean. We'll talk about a rain shadow. Let's get going. Okay, one main thing I wanna show you Okay, something important I want to show you on this map. All the yellow, the green, most of the colors, that's owned by the federal government, okay? Those are called public lands. As opposed to this cream-colored land, that's owned by private individuals or private land. It's private property, if you say. Um, Utah, about 66.5% of the land is owned by the federal government or controlled by the federal government. And this is gonna be a point of friction, both between the people as like private individuals versus the government, and then the government, meaning state and local government, versus the federal government, okay? Who controls Utah? And this creates friction, especially when there's, um, you know, like heritage sites, artifacts involved. I'll throw a video on the end of this if you're interested in watching about Recapture Canyon. It's, it's, it, it sums up some of the friction involved in Utah. So let's keep going. The difference between, okay, so what's the difference between a national park and a national forest? A national park, we wanna preserve it, keep it perfect. They say, uh, leave only, take only pictures, leave only footprints. You wanna make it nice for the future generations or leave it nice. In a national forest, it's not so much preservation, it's conservation. You can use nature, but let's use it properly. So for example, you can get a, a, a permit and chop down a tree. I did it in Dixie National Forest back when I lived in Cedar City. And they're not gonna let you cut down too many trees and they have regulations on which ones can be cut and which ones can't, so we're gonna use it properly. But you can, you can cut a tree down in a national forest. Okay, climate. Latitude, elevation, distance from the ocean. Memorize them, know them. Let's learn why that's the case. Uh-oh, big red arrow must be important. Oh, so big. Okay, um, remember latitude. Latitude are these lines here, okay? The closer to the equator, the more direct insulation, the warmer it's gonna be. You get to the top, it's gonna be cold. Latitude affects the climate. Your elevation affects the climate, okay? Don't confuse that with altitude. Altitude is a measurement of above the earth, but elevation is a measurement of the earth. I know, but you'll, you, you, you drive down the road, you get to the peak, it'll say elevation, whatever, 6,000 feet or something. Altitude is a little bit different. You're not measuring the earth, you're above sea level, but you're measuring from the earth. Anyway, the answer is elevation, remember that. Okay, uh, distance from the ocean. When the solar insulation hits the water, it dissipates, it mitigates, and when it hits the land, it gets absorbed. So in general, when you get farther away from the ocean, you get more temperature extremes, in general. I'll throw this up there. Tem temperature inversion, I'm not sure this is in your book, but it, I promise you it'll be in the newscast coming up this winter if you watch the weather newscast. Temperature inversion, and that just means this warm air, which is normally down here, is blocking the air from rising and sends the smog back down on us. Okay, rain shadow. You've got your cloud, okay? The sun hits the ocean, forms the cloud. The cloud comes, hits the mountain, drops the rain, and now the cloud goes and it has no rain on it. And so it's gonna be dry over here. So I hope you can see this, but this is the Sierra Nevada mountains and they're all green on one side and brown on the other. You can see how green this whole area is and how brown that whole area is. And so Utah is both in the shadow, the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevadas, and then also we have our own rain shadow 
because the Wasatch Mountains will stop the rain and that's why it's so dry over there, especially if you've ever been to Blanding, that's pretty dry. Um, who owns the most land in Utah? The federal government. Okay, so now we're getting on to some newer stuff. Let's go. All right, in this lesson, we're gonna talk about fossils, okay? We're talking about a little bit of geology. Um, what else are we gonna talk about that's really important? We'll mention faults and earthquakes a little bit. Rock and mineral resources, the salt, the coal. We'll talk a bit about the rock cycle. Listen, the book wants you to know igneous rock. I'll give you my hint, it ignite, igneous. Think fire, think igneous rock, it'll help you out. Um, Lake Bonneville, that one's pretty awesome. In fact, if you look out the window, you can see the edge of Lake Bonneville, but there's more to it than just that. Utah was actually covered twice by, by ocean or seas, they call it. Um, covered by water, we'll say. Um, mudslides, I got a pretty good video of that. So let's roll. Know the difference between physical and human geography? Hopefully you do. Uh, humans, human geography means we built it. Cities, roads, something like that. Physical geography, the lake, the mountain, the ocean, something like that. Okay, check this out. We've named a new dinosaur, Moabasaurus utahensis. It has a long neck, a long tail, a huge elephant-like body. It's about 10 meters long, but that's small for a sauropod. We collected it near Moab, Utah, at a site called Dalton Wells. We've pulled over 5,500 bones from this one site, most of them belonging to this animal. So this is the humerus. This is from the left side. It's this bone right here. Look at these bones. You can learn all kinds of things about them. Uh, you can tell the angle they held their arms in or out at by looking at the bevel down here. So we have 18 individuals based on these brain cases we found. This would be where it hooks up to the vertebra. This is where the brain would be. And the brain extends only from here to here. It's the size of a Chinese egg roll. They have small brains. They were herbivores. They have very coarse teeth. And these were not useful for chewing the food. They were just useful for biting the food off and then swallowing it. So 125 million years ago, when these animals died, there was a drought. And during this drought, hundreds, if not maybe a thousand or so animals died. The surviving animals walked along and crushed these bones. And that's why only 3% of the bones we collected at this quarry are actually complete. It was found near Moab, Utah, so we honor the city for that. A paleontologist would think of Moab as a gold mine of dinosaur bones. We're really excited about this new dinosaur. It's one we've been working on for decades. We had to collect huge numbers of bones in order to get enough that were complete to describe the new animal. So we're thrilled to now have them all together and hang a name on this fellow, Moabasaurus utahensis. All right, so that was pretty interesting. They found so many, there's a triceratops they found as well that's a Utah triceratops. They find a lot of dinosaur bones out here in Utah. Okay, so a geologist is a scientist who learns about the history of the earth by studying rocks and rock formations. And so that's a geologist, as opposed to an archeologist which studies artifacts, okay? Um, eras, have you ever heard of this, eras? Okay, eras are a way of measuring time. And so a large measurement of time based upon, you know, similar rocks, plants, animals um, that were around during that time. You got the Precambrian, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic. Uh, you need a review? Dinosaur train. Don't you love the dinosaur train? We're going back in time to the time of the Jurassic or whatever. Okay, um, how does a fossil get formed? By the way, do you guys watch Dinosaur Train? My, my little four-year-old loves it. Anyhow, um, fossils are formed when minerals are interchanged with the organic matter of a living thing that has died. All right, look, here's the crocodile. It's dead, it's turned to bones. And then over millions of years, it gets infused with minerals and it basically becomes sort of, sort of, kind of like a rock. It becomes hard and it becomes fossilized. Well, when that happens to some of the organic material, notice that's the Paleozoic era and then this is today. Uh, when it happens to the organic material, you can get coal, all right? I also want to go back. Look, uh, there's Paleozoic, there's coal. That's how, that's how long it is ago. It's a long time ago. Real quick recap, what word symbolizes the spirit of Utah? It's our state motto. What is it, what is it, what's it? Industry, good job, the art of working hard. Um, 
Okay, here's the rock cycle. You've got metamorphic rock, it comes up as igneous rock, it cools down and it becomes sedimentary rock and, it, and just back and forth and around and around it goes. They want you to know the volcanic rock, the igneous rock. Think volcano, think fire, think ignite and you'll remember igneous rock. Utah was once covered by what? Ancient seas. What was Utah once covered by? I can't hear you. Well, that's because you're online. Okay. Anyway, um, shallow seas, okay? Once co covered by shallow seas. There is Utah, 100% underwater. And then as the water recedes, you'll eventually get Lake Bonneville. Besides the water, what do you think about when you go to the ocean? Seashells, maybe? Maybe surfing? You'll notice that we have, you know, sandstone and especially when you go to Zion and whatnot. And that's because at some point all of this was underwater. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, igneous rock from fire. Okay, we feel good about that. Okay, whose fault is it? It's nobody's fault. It's the Earth's fault. It's, a cr it's the fault in the Earth. Okay, what is a fault? It's a fracture in the Earth's crust. And I hope you can see it right here. These are the faults. Okay. Mountain formation. Okay, different ways the mountains can be formed. In the earth, hopefully you know this already, the different tectonic plates. The tectonic plates, they can bump into each other and then they can make a mountain. Okay, so that's one thing. The volcano can erupt and then the fault lines, you can have the slipping of the faults. So here we go. It's DJ, it's DJ uh, mountain formation time. Are you ready? Let's do our little mountain. The plates are bumping into each other. That's like Himalayas. Look at the Himalaya mountains. You got two big plates. Okay. Let's do volcano. And then let's do DJ fault line. You got <laughs> One of the types of forces we just learned about. Types that make mountains. All right. Thanks, Yoda. What are Utah trust lands? Lands that make money for schools, good job. Three factors of climate, do you remember those? Okay, great. Erosion, so, you know, I've been out there, I've been on the tourist thing, they'll tell you wind, water, and et cetera. It's mostly water that does the, the big eroding, okay? Water does the most, and ice, that counts as water, right? Um, here's Lake Bonneville. As you can see, we would be underneath the water. Uh, ice age ends, ice becomes water, remnants of this lake are the Great Salt Lake, the Utah Lake, Sevier Lake, it's in page 36 of your book, go ahead and take a look at that. I would like you to take a look at one of the hills, so we, again, basin range, basin range, if you look at any of these hills, you can see, especially, you, know, you can see the edge of where Lake Bonneville used to be. Um, Here's Stockton. I was going to say, especially in Stockton, you can really see that edge and it just looks like a shoreline. So take a look with your own eyes and see that and just remember that this has all been underwater at some point. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, Utah salt, it can be used for lots of different things, but it's primarily used for water softeners and icy roads, according to your book. I know someone who uses it for bath bombs, but whatever. All right, now we're going to talk about natural disasters. The number one biggest, most expensive natural disaster in Utah, mudslide, flood, too much water. The snowpack melts, maybe it's rained and it's snowed, and then we get some type of mudslide or flood from that. So let's watch this quick video. So much, Holly. Okay, right, we're watching thanks. the video that uh, Holly and Mike Steven uh, they were witness to all of this just a short time ago. Honestly, they arrived there just after 6 o'clock this morning before anything was really moving. Holly was doing a story because there was concern. Look at that. Just oh, the this whole is a time hillside. Lapse of the whole hillside mm -hmm. coming down. That gives me the chills to it watch. It does. Our live oh. truck pulling down the mast and getting out of the way. It, wow. Look at that. Unbelievable. Just pushing. And this is on the street above. Yeah, and, and we're watching this for the first time ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
And, and as Mary was mentioning, Holly and Mike, our photographer, were there just to do a, a, a live shot this morning, stand in front of what was going on there, and to their disbelief, the whole hill started coming down. So she was there when this was happening. And uh, that is so dramatic to watch that time lapse. And All right, welcome back. So I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Um, keep studying, make sure you take good notes. There's a quiz on Wednesday, and that quiz is for everybody. Hybrid, four day, online only. So do your best with the quiz. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope I didn't go too fast for you. Give me a little tip on the pacing, whether I went too slow or too fast. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. A battle over the question of local control versus federal power is playing out in the western U.S. once again. And this time it involves a prized Native American archaeological site. It's happening in Utah, where federal prosecutors filed criminal charges of conspiracy yesterday against five men who organized an illegal all-terrain vehicle ride into a canyon closed to motorized vehicles. Seven years ago, federal land managers closed the canyon to ATVs and the like to protect it. Since that time, the dispute has come to stand for a much larger fight. Jeffrey Brown visited the canyon and the protest organizers for his series, Culture at Risk. It's called Recapture Canyon. 28 miles of rocky cliffs, juniper trees, and wildlife in southeast Utah. And for hundreds of years, beginning around 500 A.D., it was home to a large Native American Pueblo population. So how many people would have lived in a place like this? In a structure like this, you would have probably had an extended family, 10, 12, maybe up to 15 people. Utah archaeologist Jody Patterson brought us on a mile-long hike into recapture to see the remains of one of its many cliff dwellings. It's a little like an apartment complex built into the rock here. That's exactly what this is. Yeah. We got enough rooms for living, for cooking, for sleeping, and of course some activity areas too for doing some other things out in front. For archaeologists and history buffs, Recapture Canyon is a gold mine, one that requires careful preservation. We need to understand the impacts that are going to be happening to sites like this throughout the canyon before we open it up and just let everybody come in. And seven years ago, the Federal Bureau of Land Management agreed. Megan Crandall is a BLM spokeswoman. In 2007, we decided to close the canyon because of the amazing cultural and archaeological resources that are here. We needed to protect them from the degradation that can occur when uh, you're using the area with um, motorized recreation. But the years of closure have angered many. Earlier this summer, local residents, all-terrain vehicle enthusiasts, and states' rights advocates came to recapture to protest what they see as a blatant abuse of power by the federal government. Hundreds showed up, some riding illegally into the canyon. John Felmuth attended the recapture protest, though he rode no further than the canyon closure. It just seems like ATV use, which we view as a perfectly legitimate, is oft times cast as a inappropriate and damaging use of the, of the, of the outdoors, the federal lands. It's simply not the case. <laughs> Last May's demonstration in recapture came only weeks after the showdown in Nevada between the well-armed rancher Cliven Bundy and the BLM over unpaid grazing fees. So tensions throughout the West were high. There's something magical about it. San Juan County Commissioner so Phil Lyman was the man who organized the recapture protest. Walking along the cliffs above the canyon, Lyman says he too has a sense of history and love for this place. You know, that's been there for... You know, 800 years. Lyman, who lives in nearby Blanding, comes from a long line of Mormon settlers who founded towns across the state. To those of us who live here and our grandparents and our great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were involved in building those roads, you can't just erase a, a, a town's history that way. For Lyman, this dispute is about how much say local governments have over federal land decisions. It's a major issue in a state where the federal government owns two-thirds of all land. It was the BLM's disregard for local interests, local culture, the local people, the people who live here and have lived here for, for a long, long time. That's why I say it was not about recapture. It was not about ATVs. It was trying to get a message through that there are actually people here. We have the same rights to exist in this area that you have the rights to exist, you know, 
in Washington, D.C. or wherever you come from. He says local officials should have the right to decide how to use what he sees as a well-established pathway. And he's angered by the length of time this has all taken, seven years and running. Now, is this the same age as this one? In response, BLM spokeswoman Megan Crandall told us that determining environmental and other impacts is a complicated process. We have a responsibility to look at things like water, look at wildlife, look at plant resources, soil resources. The whole thing creates a holistic picture, and that takes time. Well, one of the things we hear from people is just this frustration with process, heavy-handedness, lack of engagement. Well, first of all, I have to say BLM Utah is not heavy-handed. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that here in San Juan County on BLM lands, there's 2,800 miles of trail that are open to motorized recreation, which is about the distance between New York and LA. That's a lot of trail. Crandall also points out that Recapture Canyon is still open to non-motorized travel, hikers and horseback riders. Odd about this for is Phil Lyman, that's not the point. It's just rolling over the top of, of, of communities. And you know, this, this resonates with other rural, uh, rural western communities because they've seen it themselves. They're, they're dealing with the BLM. So one of you will run a tape. 200 miles yeah, to the north in Utah's Nine Mile Canyon, Jerry Spangler agrees there's something bigger going on, even if he disagrees with Lyman about everything else. Right now, the main task is to get this, this large uh, residential feature documented and get the rock art documented and the relationship of any artifacts to those two features, okay? Spangler is an archaeologist working to preserve sites throughout Utah, including thousands of petroglyphs like the Great Hunter Panel. He sees a variety of potential threats, from well-organized oil and gas exploration to random vandalism. I use the example all the time that archaeological sites are like books. And that book will tell you a, a complete story about the people who live there. but. Once you start denigrating the site, you're just ripping out pages out of that book. And you rip out enough pages, pretty soon the story doesn't make any sense. We, we want to keep the book together. We've got a library of books that can tell us a very rich story about people who lived a thousand years ago. Meanwhile, San Juan County commissioners, including Phil Lyman, recently voted to bring a lawsuit against the BLM to force a decision on motorized vehicles in Recapture Canyon. Jeff has more on our website about archaeological sites at risk in Utah. Tomorrow night, he'll have a second story about a very different kind of dispute over land use in the West, extreme sports.